Kuzambola, uh, dear panelists, moderator, participants, and viewers. Now. Happy New Year and Happy uh, New Dollar. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all our esteemed guests to the first uh, series of Edu Talk and the second panel in the first series. Now. I would like to welcome everyone and I would like to also thank you for your time and participation. Now. To give a br brief background on Edu Talk, Edu Talk was inspired by the Royal Address at the National Day Celebrations at Punaka on 17th of December 2020. So Vitop seeks to discuss the future of education through a series of conversations on EduTalk. A unique feature of these conversations is that the panelists will consist of Bhutanese society and beyond. The initial conversations will provide the platform for voices from outside the education family so that they can share their experiences, perspectives, and insights. We will be looking forward to similar sessions with different panelists. I would also like to make a humble submission here saying that we would like to acknowledge the wonderful journey of modern education in Bhutan. We have achieved so much thus far. We offer our gratitude to all our education families and their contribution to the education in Bhutan. Coming to the conversation, the series here is divided into seven themes with each team taking up a session from 1st January to 7th January. Panelists will share their expertise or experience in the Buddhist education system, their current views and beliefs, and offer their recommendations to address key issues in education. It is expected that the final report with a set of recommendations will be compiled and submitted to the Minister of Education and other relevant offices with a view to co-create education system that is resilient, responsive, and flexible while serving the current needs in nation building. All the sessions will happen on Zoom, and for the information, it will be recorded to be shared on official Vitop social media. Before I end here, I would like to make some disclaimers. Edu Talk Bhutan is a humble and voluntary initiative to look at education as a collective responsibility among citizens so that we can come together to co create, collaborate, and consult, as well as inspire each other to gather forward. Thoughts and opinions expressed in the conversations are solely of the panelists and not necessarily of their employer, organization, or other group or individual. Once again, the main aim of these conversations is to get everyone to engage in something as important and critical as education so that we might take collective responsibility for and contribute to that which impact us all, an effort to come together. With this, I would like to welcome our panelists and moderator for today. We have Mr. Kezang, who is the current CEO of Better Parkla. We have Mr. Nudub Zangpo, the Executive Director of Bhutan Media Foundation, followed by Mr. Ngawang Galton, a business leader and a, the festival producer for Drukil's Literature Festival. We have Sangeet Duji, a young media technologies, IoT programmer, and a drone trainer. We have Ms. Sangil Hazom, Sangil Hazom Tinle, who is currently working as, a, as an analyst at Infotech Department with DHI. We would like to welcome Ms. Sixen Pek Doji, the founder and advisor of BCMD. Lastly, we have Dr. Sige du Tring Sige Doji, who is the CEO of Timpotech Parkla. And we would also love to welcome our panelist, Ms. Namge Zam, who needs no introduction, and she is the executive director of Journalist Association of Bhutan. Before I hand over the floor, uh, the platform to Namge, I would like to make a uh, house announcement to the panelists. In any part of the conversation, la, do let us know if you don't wish to be quoted or recorded, la, because the videos will be recorded and shared on Vitop social media. La. So do let us know if you don't wish to be quoted or recorded in any part of the video. La. Lastly, as the organizer, I wish everyone a fruitful conversation and thank you for coming on board. La. Thus, namge. Thank you, Sasanam. Um, I do have 
a small opening statement for the session. Um, a lot has transpired in the past one year as a result of the pandemic. We've seen education in Bhutan employ technology like never before. While it may be considered high tech by general Bhutanese standards, on the global stage, it isn't. We've been incredibly slow on the tech uptake. If it weren't for COVID-19, we'd still very much have carried on with traditional classroom learning. So in a way, the pandemic has been a blessing for the Bhutanese education system in the country. It led to an overnight transformation of national education. This was, however, not without its fair share of challenges as we were and are all witness to. We weren't technologically equipped to make the digital leap. There were economic, physical, and infrastructural challenges to consider. Many students had to purchase smartphones to be educated online. Many families did not have access to a TV even. Innumerable parents and children, despite owning digital devices, did not have the digital knowledge for a smooth transition to remote or online learning. While the transition to digital learning did take place, we have nothing to gauge the impact by. We are assuming at this point that the role of the teacher and the learner changed due to the transition. But did it really? Despite the long overdue shift, the overwhelming perception is that students may not have taken away as much from online learning. Now imagine with great optimism that the pandemic ends within the next few months. Do we relegate online education to the sidelines as an interim measure? We know for certain that there will be an education channel on BBS thanks to Vito, but what of online learning? I'm quite afraid that we will return to what is familiar and easier, the traditional classroom setting. Except for the Royal Temple College, hardly any of our educational spaces have adequate support for digital learning. Where are the computer or the IT labs? So how do we ensure that we sustain this transition and mainstream technology in education? I expect that this panel will have excellent views on the way forward. And with that, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Ampek La. Oh, also, uh, before Ampek starts speaking, just to let you know that there is no pressure to speak for 15 minutes. I think we uh, made the adjustments and said five to 10 minutes is great as well. And I will give you a reminder once um, you reach five minutes and then on to 10 minutes. La. Thank you. That's a relief to know. In the tech world, I think uh, nowadays with YouTube, I'm told you shouldn't be more than three minutes, but I will be at least double that, but I'll try and keep it short. But thank you. Namge for, you know, giving us this very hopeful start that the pandemic might end tomorrow. But uh, basically, I, I guess, you know, we live in a world of such rapid fire change, right, with the pandemic. And before that, it was climate change. Um, we just, I just heard a speech by the SecGen of UNDP talking about us being in an environmental crisis, you know, despite the Paris Agreement on climate change. Politics, we've seen the global politics in the last one year, economy. So this is really, you know, talking about an uncertain future and preparing our young people and not just young people, people like ourselves, you know, who want to continue to be uh, relevant, you know, to be able to learn about what to do in such changing times is a critical task. And therefore, I think the wisdom of His Majesty the King calling for a reform of education at this point in time but um, I'm going to go kind of broad. I, I know Sonam was talking, uh, thinking that maybe I could talk a, a bit more and share a bit about the social media work that we've been doing. But I want to go a little broad on education, having heard from a few of the speakers yesterday, and then zoom into a bit of the current situation, and then um, make a very quick uh, recommendation for the way forward, right? So we're talking about technology. I think... Um, you know, not so long ago, we could barely talk to members of our family across Bhutan, you know, and we could, didn't even have a phone connection. But today, everything is possible, right? All of us are online in school. You know, we despair when our phone is not working well. Uh, we despair when we don't have a connection. I think technology has really helped us to stay, at least in Bhutan, um, well-connected. And in a landlocked country, communications is, you know, critical. So it's been really good for us. There's so much opportunity now as our information systems are being developed. So, for example, in health, if uh, technology could 
uh, can enable us to collect more data about what's happening in the hospitals, in the outreach clinics, and et cetera, it can really help us to improve medical learning, for example, right? Um, uh, we have amazing tools, Google Earth. I mean, I just went on it and I found to my delight, you can actually walk the main streets of Hassa. You can go to many parts of the world and look, you know, so there are so many opportunities there. And I guess uh, we have also expressed interest in STEM education and we have a digital drukyul plan for Bhutan. All well and good. But I, as I reflected on the theme today, I thought that... Um, I'm still going to look at technology uh, more simply as a tool or a medium to permit us to do something. Um, so that, uh, you know, this old adage of, you know, are we, are we driving technology or is technology driving us, you know, is the question. So um, to step into this world of technology and to embrace it or to integrate it into our daily learning, I think um, we've already realized that we have to change our mindsets and even our education system in several ways. First of all, uh, many ed educators have pointed out the need for greater flexibility, the need for creativity in education, right? So that we can enable more innovative mindsets to grow. So today in Bhutan, I mean, we're gonna have several more fab labs being developed, right? In colleges uh, and in se selected high schools. I think this is wonderful and it'll really enable our young people and even, you know, older ones who want to sign up to explore, to test, to innovate, right? And um, critical thinking is the other one that many of us are, you know, very um, bent on. We, we believe that uh, in some of the work that we do in civil society and in, in certain schools, the ability to shape uh, people's critical thinking uh, uh, um, abilities so that we can cut to the core, we can judge, we, we can actually ascertain what information uh, that's now being shared, let's say in the world of technology and communications and social media is verified, is believable, what is fake, what is not, right? Because um, the speed of communications and information cuts across. Um, cultures. While we talk about the need and we all acknowledge the need for creativity, for critical thinking, I think to foster that we also need a change in the schools and the school system itself because it's not enough for us to like walk into a lab and that's the time when we can you know question and debate and deliberate and find and test and do all these but when we go back to the reg regular classroom if all it is is about study, taking notes, then there's a real conflict there. So um, the question, you know, which was posed by Namgye also, is like if we go back to school tomorrow and we really want, you know, to continue with online learning, we want to create a whole new generation of young people who can problem solve solutions, it's not enough creating laboratories where they can test it. I realize now the whole system itself needs to be looked into to, in order to foster that kind of thinking and uh, questioning. And uh, I think uh, King Tsering mentioned in a forum in November earlier, he says uh, people need to fail quickly, you know, learn, test, fail quickly and move on, learn from our mistakes. Um, so tech tools, right, are important and are critical and uh, are very important. But similarly, it's not just the technology, a whole environment, not just in school, but even at home, in the offices, you know, in, in the public institutions that we visit, how open are we? You know, how creative are we? You know, otherwise I sense, I do sense that, um, oh, video off, okay. I sense that um, <clears throat> some of our young people, uh, finding that conflict very glaring, you know, and quite difficult to transcend. Um, and I want to talk very quickly on social emotional skills. Um, I know it's going to be part of a full session later on, but if we're going to integrate technology into our world of learning, then social emotional skills is a must because we are living in a world of, you know, with less human contact 
and much more online time right now, right? Social emotional intelligence is also critical because we do see, we haven't tracked it in, in Bhutan, but we see the world around us and we're learning that there's a growing level of depression, anxiety, you know, a sense of low esteem that many people feel when we use social media, when we use technology, and when we don't look like celebrities, we feel the peer mm -hmm. pressure, right? So um, while technology offers uh, some illusion of companionship and friendship with likes, you know, etc., cetera, um, we're not that great at handling our own real relationships, right? And, and communicating with real people, which has the risk of, you know, emotional sort of communications as well. So I think social um, emotional skills needs to be really thought about carefully. And then, of course, working with parents. I think with the technology that we talk about today uh, and in education, we're always talking about the school, the teacher and the kid and the children, but we never remember the family. And I feel that maybe that's um, an important missing link that we have to um, be wary of. You know, parents, we ourselves are not so clued in. You know, and we think we tend to um, welcome technology and we think it's wonderful. But at a very recent workshop uh, that, uh, you know, Sonam and I were uh, involved in, we also found that some parents, you know, permit their children as young as six years of age uh, to come online on some programs like TikTok and to create, you know, videos and programs, uh, not realizing the pressures of putting little children, you know, out in public domain, you know, um, um, you know, um, and, and wanting endorsement by people who may not even know them from strangers, for example. So, this is where I read with some concern when uh, the Ministry of Education mentioned that one of their plans for the upcoming uh, year or so is to provide tablets, you know, as a learning device for every child from pre-primary upwards. Um, I'm just bringing this up. I kind of feel like we need to uh, look around us and have a good plan. And I personally do not think uh, at the age of five or six, six actually, is PP, uh, whether, you know, without educating the whole family, whether it's necessary at this point, I think we should start from the older youth or older learners and move downwards and observe, okay? And I say this because, uh, for example, it, even in a place like France, the, the, you know, many, several countries have actually stopped elementary school, middle school children from bringing their smartphones and tablets to school. And as recently as 2018, uh, the parliament in France actually uh, even um, stopped them from using it during lunch and break periods, you know. Uh, the officials there were really concerned about the addiction to screen screens and this factor sort of far outweighs the benefits of learning in a real environment. So these are things that we should just think about because technology is a two-edged sword. So and underlying all, all of this, I think technology, again, you know, we constantly remind ourselves it's a tool, right? How do we use it? You know, uh, do we use it for, you know, to do the wrong things more efficiently? You know, for example, like spreading this without realizing it, right? Or subject. Systemic change, right? Uh, technology is a tool and it cannot replace teachers. So the teachers have to be primed and be made ready with a very different set of skills so that they can bring lessons to life, all right? And by teachers, I'm not referring just to the teachers in schools and colleges, but also to the parents and siblings at home who are also modeling something for the younger ones. So recommendations very broadly, uh, one or two you know, things. First of all, I feel that 
you know, I listened in yesterday and I do agree. Uh, I think it was Kama Funso who mentioned this. And um, I think we need a long-term education vision and policy that will, you know, include technology in it. And uh, this uh, has to be at least 20 years long, at least. I think education is a long-term journey, is not a five-year journey. And I think if we can include all the political parties in the deliberation of what we want out of education, think long term, so that no matter who comes into the seat of governance, you know, we have already agreed on this. And this then will assure us a, a clearer pathway. See, what I see is um, um, uh, in, in some of my work also with um, the universities, I kind of feel like people are coming up with a mishmash of courses. A lot of it is to cater to the market. And, um, but what we really need is a vision, right? Which will then find its immediate expression in the type of courses that we offer. If we don't have a clear vision, we're just offering courses that might lead to perhaps a job. And I'm not sure that that should be the raison d'etre for education, you know, uh, for individual survival, it's important. Uh, for a job, that's also important. But I think, you know, education goes a little beyond that, is to prepare citizens, you know, to, and not just uh, Bhutanese citizens, but citizens of the world to be able to problem solve. So uh, I mentioned a few things about bringing parents into the system, into the learning process. We need a change in the way we run the schools. Uh, we need to make it more participatory and democratic and open. Um, then for technology, very specifically, media literacy needs to be, you know, uh, spread across the board. It shouldn't be just a choice when you reach grade 11 and 12. I think we should go younger from even grade 5, you know, from the time you're 10. Because I think globally, I think I read somewhere that, uh, let's say in the US, 8 out of 10 youth are on Facebook before they're 10 years old. And I know that many of our own children uh, do not reach the, the required age of 13. Many of them are on Facebook way before that. So media literacy, uh, social media policy for schools, guidelines for the family, you know, how do they use, when do they give tablets to young people? Uh, how do they guide and, and watch uh, how the young people use technology? Um, I think there's a, there are many, many lessons out there and we need to be wary of these lessons and we need to learn from what the world is going through. There is an increasing amount of screen addiction, depression because uh, you know, of uh, increased use of technology and lack of real personal communications and social relationships. So these are just some uh, very quick ideas. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ampek. You're right um, on time, 15 minutes exactly. <laughs> I think you had an internal timer or something. Thank you so much. Oh, um, thank you. Uh, for speaking very broadly and touching upon uh, very important aspects related, particularly to uh, media literacy and social media. And I will be following up with questions on that, um, just to let you know, because I know moderators have been asked to summarize um, sessions, but I think I'll do it for all speakers at the end. Um, the next speaker, I'd like to request Mr. Keza. Uh, uh Thank you, moderator Namgi for giving me this opportunity, uh, distinguished uh, co-panelists for session two, um, technology and education of the EduTalk uh, Bhutan series. Um, I take this opportunity to make a presentation on the learning and development uh, framework of uh, the Bhutan Education and Technology Academy park located at uh, Chamjeka above uh, Kabesa in the Yangfell real estate complex. To begin with, uh, why did we start uh, this uh, 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 ecosystem? Um, we 
from our market uh, research findings, we found uh, there was haphazard access to appropriate technologies and lack of employable workforce. So this was our uh, problem statement. And uh, the solution statement uh, we have uh, come up with is uh, to deliver 21st century economy entrepreneurial workforce by harnessing technology for equity in Bhutan. The catchphrase is technology for equity in education. Uh, uh, segregating uh, or splitting up the problem statement, uh, what we are trying to solve. Number one, limited market ready technology and business skill talent pool. Number two, large number of students go abroad to pursue higher education. Number three, mismatch between tertiary education versus market needs. This has been a perennial talk um, among us all. Number four is lack of entrepreneurial culture and product first uh, mindset. So these four uh, problems um, need to be solved. That's what we found out. And in response, uh, splitting up our solution statement, uh, what we are trying to do, uh, we actually uh, have uh, the learning and development uh, component of the ecosystem. Uh, and then the tech park component, uh, which uh, uh, comprises of uh, uh, co-working spaces, startups, advisory and incubation, serviced offices, and digital nomads uh, services. So, um, in essence, uh, uh, it's it's a combination. It's a Silicon uh, Valley, a little Silicon Valley model that we are trying to uh, implement. Um, rather, Silicon Hill, we call it. Uh, in the sense of uh, um, even, for instance, uh, commercializing students' uh, project ideas in an incubation center. And uh, when they uh, go out into the market, uh, they go out with that business uh, as an entrepreneur or ready to get into any corporate uh, setting uh, for life. Um, we have uh, six uh, components of our LND uh, framework. Number one is LND model. Uh, number two, facilitation approach. Uh, number three, instructional design framework. Number four, assessment methods. Number five, our offerings. And number six, university progression pathways. In terms of the learning and development model, what we are using is the 70 20 10 model which means 70% uh, experiential learning, 20% uh, social learning, and 10% formal learning, as opposed to what is currently there in Bhutan, uh, mostly an 80-20 uh, 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 formal learning to uh, practical uh, aspects of uh, learning, which is uh, completely opposite to what uh, we are, are trying to do. Uh, this, uh, the 70-20-10 model offers flexibility uh, for uh, all those involved, uh, teachers, students, uh, and also encourages collaboration uh, to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Uh, it also facilitates student independence and autonomy, promotes student ownership uh, as a self-driving force, uh, and uh, offers meaningful experiential development uh, for the student. It also encompasses uh, applied knowledge, skills, and abilities. In terms of the facilitation approach, uh, we uh, use a hybrid facilitation approach combining uh, the lecture style, um, coaching style, activity style, and group style depending on the needs of the student, depending on the learning path that uh, the student uh, likes. And the goal is to build a cooperative community of learners where teaching will be a shared activity, a shared learning activity. A personalized uh, learning adapt to students' needs, enhances student engagement, fuses different ways of learning, and creates a lifelong learning culture to develop a self-driving force for learning, unlearning, and relearning. Instructional Design Framework. 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis the LND model that we have, 70, 2010 model. Um, experiential learning will comprise of uh, things like practicals, case studies, field visits, uh, internships and apprenticeships, exchange programs, uh, field work. Uh, whereas under social learning, uh, it will comprise of guest lectures, conferences, focus groups, um, group works, uh, assignment mentorships, and uh, the 10% formal learning, of course, will comprise of lectures, seminars, self-paced LMS, uh, learning management system, which will provide uh, for tutorials and self-study, access to e-library and uh, workshops. Uh, in the context of um, the current system that we have, uh, as per uh, the uh, Bhutan um, qualification framework, uh, uh, it, 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 uh, this uh, three components, experiential, social, and formal learning, um, is reflected as uh, a theory, uh, which is a classroom, LMS, and guest lectures, um, then practical, uh, comprising of research for assignments, case studies, field visits, group works, focus groups, and on-the-job training, the third one, uh, which is in the form of internships, uh, exchange programs, apprenticeships, and uh, field works. Assessment methods. Uh, our assessment method is based on the Bloom's taxonomy, uh, aimed to trans support attention, retention, and transfer of learning. It, it's a uh, as uh, opposed to uh, a, a one-time or a two-time assessment uh, in a year, uh, ours will be based on a continuous assessment uh, method, uh, uh, comprising uh, combining both uh, continuous formative as well as summative assessments. In terms of uh, courses that we offer, we offer three levels of courses, level three, level four, and level five. And uh, we do that on three tracks. Uh, based on the market uh, uh, survey, market research that uh, we have done uh, in terms of uh, uh, the three tracks uh, that we offer are business and management, startups and entrepreneurship, computer science uh, and uh, IT, which uh, also includes uh, cyber security. So these are the three tracks that we offer at three levels, level three, level four and level five. And uh, to qualify for level three, uh, we are taking in students with, with the class 8 plus some experience uh, which uh, uh, can be uh, um, considered uh, um, prior learning um, and, and we give uh, credit for that uh, through what is called the recognition for prior learning which is uh, there in the Bhutan qualifications framework as well as the Bhutan vocational uh, qualifications uh, framework. So we are going as far as class eight, uh, and then uh, level three, uh, uh, level four, uh, level five. Level four is equivalent to year one bachelor's degree, and level five is equivalent to year two of uh, a three-year bachelor's degree. And uh, the idea, uh, basically, uh, is to uh, actually uh, uh, facilitate uh, level six, which is the final year uh, of a bachelor's degree where students can have the opportunity if they want to pursue bachelor's to go outside to countries like Sri Lanka, uh, UK, uh, Australia, Malaysia, Thailand uh, and uh, many others uh, with whom we are uh, in the process of uh, um, building uh, partnerships. Uh, this slide shows uh, the Bhutan qualification framework progression pathways and that's what uh, we are following. Uh, we are uh, emphasizing on 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 the on facilitating uh, or uh, um, implementing the the pathway that uh, this uh, slide uh, shows in the sense of uh, uh, how uh, vocational and technical education uh, uh, can uh, link with the school education and uh, higher education. Uh, so. Um, uh, we are also aware that uh, there is a lot of stigma around uh, the TVET uh, um, students uh, that uh, we produce and uh, we are trying to uh, uh, transform uh, uh, or catapult that uh, mindset uh, uh, in, in the coming years uh, by um, uh, showing to the world that uh, such uh, 
um, you know, tertiary education graduates uh, uh, are the need of the hour, um, people uh, with the holistic uh, skills. Uh, and of course, if you want to do your higher education, you can still um, uh, finish the diploma and uh, go uh, to a bachelor's, uh, and, and many countries allow that. Um, also, for our three levels, you can um, uh, drop any time in, in the sense of if you uh, have a business idea and uh, want to implement it or if you have uh, got a job, uh, you can you can drop uh, from that academic year, but uh, uh, you can still continue uh, with us uh, virtually or through a blended uh, model, uh, delivery model uh, that uh, we, we have. Uh, so it's not necessary for students to stay with us three years, but uh, they can drop any time and uh, they can uh, study from anywhere uh, in the world. Uh, we have uh, weekend classes. We also have uh, uh, evening classes uh, to cater to people, uh, uh, you know, uh, working if they uh, don't find the time during work to uh, study uh, for their uh, particular course. Um, so when we say level 5, uh, we are referring to level 5b as defined uh, in the tertiary education policy uh, of, of Bhutan 2010. Um, the level 5a takes you on a, a largely theory-based uh, track, um, which is what our colleges uh, are offering and colleges outside. Uh, level 5b uh, are programs that focus on practical, technical or occupational skills for direct, mm -hmm. entry, direct entry into the level market. So that's where um, uh, we, we are um, in, in terms of uh, building a market-ready employable workforce. And level 6, just for your information, are programs that are devoted to advanced studies and original research, which is a bachelor's, uh, third year of equivalent to third year of bachelor's degree. Uh, through our international franchiser, London Institute of uh, Business and Technology, um, we are bringing in uh, uh, quality uh, diplomas uh, from the UK. Uh, the quality diplomas are a set of UK qualifications regulated and accredited by the Office of Qualifications and Examinations Regulation of call and provide a formal way of letting working professionals or any adult students to achieve uh, officially accepted academic awards that are equivalent to the regulated qualification uh, framework in the UK levels 4, 5, level 6, or even postgraduate level 7 qualification. Uh, Qualify offers a range of flexible higher education pathways. In, um, in a nutshell, uh, it, it provides, facilitates tracks that are faster than uh, traditional uh, education um, uh, mm, uh, pathways in the sense uh, a normal uh, three-year degree uh, can uh, actually be uh, done uh, through a two-year uh, track uh, that uh, Qualify uh, has designed and uh, uh, these are uh, recognized uh, internationally. Um, so basically uh, there is a big uh, difference in the sense of uh, uh, how you achieve uh, a degree without compromising on the uh, quality and uh, content of the, the uh, course that uh, you take. Uh, this slide shows, uh, an, uh, shows examples of uh, progression uh, routes uh, that uh, uh, Qualify uh, offers. Uh, uh, so for instance, level four and five diploma in business management, uh, which can be done in two academic years or can be fast-tracked in, in actually uh, 12 months, uh, can um, progress, uh, level 5 uh, uh, diploma holder can progress to a final year of, say, B.S. degree in business administration, final year of B.A. honors in business management and or international accounting. Level 4 and 5 diploma in business enterprise, the course that we offer, um, uh, can uh, progress to, um, you know, B.S. degree in marketing science, BA in marketing, BA in business management, or a BSc in international accounting. Um, while uh, level four and five can be 
uh, fast track uh, in, in 12 months. Uh, we are not going that good uh, as we are starting the institute. Uh, we are taking the two academic year uh, duration uh, for, our, uh, for our first uh, uh, few batches uh, of, of graduates uh, that uh, uh, are uh, enrolling uh, with us. So this is an example of how uh, the progression routes uh, work. And uh, I'm back, uh, uh, allude, alluded to uh, the current uh, scenario in Bhutan where uh, a lot of this uh, setups, uh, educational setups, uh, just uh, go out into the market uh, without really having a vision. Uh, and so uh, I, I just wanted to uh, let uh, the... Um, session here that uh, we have a very uh, a clear vision. Uh, our vision is to build an inclusive uh, world-class technology-enabled education and uh, innovation uh, ecosystem, a little uh, Bhutan that uh, we can uh, showcase uh, to the world. Uh, world-class uh, meaning um, we will be uh, nurturing uh, people, nurturing uh, our students uh, to be employable in any part of the world and become a digital citizen rather than just uh, looking at getting employed in the civil service uh, in Bhutan, uh, for instance. So with this, uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, you can contact us at uh, hello at the rate uh, betapark.bt. Obviously, the website is worldwideweb.betapark. Uh, thank you. Kadinchi. Uh, happy New Year. Happy Nilo. And a happy weekend to everyone. Kadinchi. I'm going to invite our next speaker, Dr. Sige. Dr. String Sige. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so uh, I think I would uh, directly get into my talk. I, I don't have a, a prepared presentation. Uh, so I have uh, thought about what to talk about in my mind, and uh, I, I think I'll probably take uh, less than 15 minutes. But uh, if I do wander around, please uh, bring me to track. So uh, firstly, uh, um, you know, to give a brief background uh, on uh, the need for such a conversation, uh, although the organizers have already talked about it, uh, I also feel that uh, this is very timely and a very important conversation. Um, uh, education uh, is the solution for everything, for any problem or any discussion that we have. And if we have to uh, brainstorm about uh, solutions, and I think if you say that, uh, if you give uh, education as one of the solutions, I think you will nev never go wrong. So that way, I think education is very important. and. Uh, 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 so the WITOP uh, taking this initiative to organize this talk, I think is uh, very great. Um, now, firstly, before I uh, uh, propose some solutions uh, using technology uh, for education, I would like to just reflect uh, briefly on some of the problems uh, and uh, why I have, uh, why I am proposing those solutions. So firstly, I would like to focus on the problems. So firstly, uh, you know, the reason that uh, we have this uh, urgent talk uh, about technology in education is because of COVID. So the COVID has left us uh, with no choice but to turn to technology uh, at this time. And uh, I, I feel that we should not let this opportunity go to waste. Now, uh, it, uh, I'm also a parent of, uh, you know, two school going children and uh, I, I have seen the challenges uh, of, uh, you know, the, the, how, how their education has been disrupted because of the COVID and how the education ministry have been trying to uh, impart, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, to have some sense of uh, uh, normal uh, uh, teaching learning going on uh, through the use of technology, but uh, there, there has been a uh, lot of problems uh, despite that. So that, that is one of the problems directly related to the COVID. And the second, second issue 
uh, that is not really related to the COVID itself, but the second problem that we have and uh, many of uh, uh, our policymakers and also a lot, lot of the parents have been talking about is the quality of education itself. So uh, uh, the quality of education, uh, many people uh, argue that uh, it can be debated whether it has really gone down or uh, whether it is, uh, you know, uh, same as before or uh, whether, whether uh, we are doing uh, good enough. Uh, that, that, uh, that is one of the views that is being expressed by uh, you know, uh, people from different sections of the society. Um, but uh, in my own opinion, I, I feel that uh, uh, the quality of education uh, really uh, needs to be improved. There is a lot of room for the quality of education to be improved. And I'm, I'm saying that uh, mainly from my own experience working at the tech park and uh, interviewing a lot of job seekers. So uh, for, for, for instance, uh, I think many of uh, you who are here, uh, there are a lot of distinguished uh, people uh, who are attending this uh, forum today, just now. Uh, you, you, you will agree with me that uh, uh, the quality of uh, you know, language, uh, that uh, uh, the competency in terms of uh, communication skills, especially uh, you know, uh, written English, um, is very poor, most, most of our young graduates, except for few, the general, you know, even after selecting, shortlisting from 300 or 400 people and you bring them down to 50 people and these 50 people's English is so poor. So it makes you sad, you know, why, why, why they have finished college and why, why is their language skill still so poor? I'm sure many of you will very well agree with me. So uh, this also reflects, I think, the probably the general skills in their, uh, you know, critical thinking and all all that. So uh, quality of quality, quality it's much needs to be improved in terms of quality session. Um, related to that, uh, just recently, actually, I, I I said it at a much bigger forum as well. Recently, uh, I was in an interview panel uh, interviewing some, uh, you know, uh, engineers and technical graduates. And the, these, these people who have studied, uh, you know, uh, IT or engineering for the last four years, fresh out of college, they are from the Bhutanese colleges. They have not heard of Elon Musk. So that, that was so saddening. And it seems that uh, many of these people who came to the interview panel, they have been, they have gone through this rigor, rigorous shortlisting. And uh, the, these are the people, you know, who, who, who like the, among the best, and they, they have not heard of uh, Elon Musk, or they, they are not really aware of the technological advances taking place elsewhere. So uh, uh, that, that is a uh, what uh, that is a sim symptom. What is the underlying cause? I think that needs to be really reflected upon. Say no, I think this this these are hard questions that we need to ask uh, to maybe RUB as well as Ministry of Education. Um, are, are the children too focused just on you know, syllabus and the exams? And uh, they, they, they are not encouraged to explore on their own. So answering questions is to do this. These are the problems. Now, how, how can we uh, solve some of these problems through technology? So I, I would like to uh, offer maybe, uh, I would like to reflect on the solutions from uh, maybe four points of view. Uh, firstly, Firstly, I, I think uh, there is a lot that uh, technology can do. Um, uh, firstly, I would like to uh, offer tech as um, uh, using technology to teach all the subjects. Any, any subject, for any subject matter, there is already vast information available online, on the internet, on YouTube's, uh, YouTube channels and all that. So, our teachers as well as lecturers, I think should use these resources, should really use these resources and to the extent possible, um, open up the eyes of our students to these resources available online. Uh, our, our children are already using you know, WeChat and Facebook and all this social media, but it seems that they are blind to all these uh, vast resources available online to learn about their particular fields of study, and keep themselves up to up to date. So um, now, 
when it comes to school education as well, if you're studying biology, uh, for example, if you're studying the, uh, the function of functions of kidney and you know how, how, how it is that kidney filters your blood, I think nowadays, nowadays there are a lot of good animation available. During our time, we had to just imagine, you know, uh, draw and all that. They, they should be exposed to all this. So technology, one, te using technology to teach any subject, uh, using the technology resources available online. Uh, I, I think that, that is very key. This is already very much possible. In fact, uh, I was telling my uh, sons that uh, in this day and age, uh, you know, few, few of the children who may be very, very much uh, interested in learning and exploring on their own, uh, they, they can beat even their teachers. They can do much better uh, than these resources available at this uh, day and age. But, uh, yeah, you, know, you know, those children who don't want to explore, uh, I think uh, they, 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 they don't know even the things that is very much related to their own subjects and which is very much talked about presently. So uh, th this is one, uh, take, uh, technology using the, you know, uh, opportunities offered by tech for any subject, you know, teach any subject. I think that, that is one. Number two is uh, using tech as a platform to enable uh, teaching and learning. So using the tech as a platform, now I'm talking about things like Google Classroom and uh, uh, maybe there are many, many other platforms. There are you know, platforms that you can purchase by paying a license fee. Uh, and many private schools are, I think, already using this in, in even in places like uh, in India, in cities like Bangalore and all that. So uh, using the tech platform to enable this teaching learning, so that you achieve what you call the blended learning, most blending, blended learning mode. Uh, that, that can be achieved through, through these different tech platforms. There are also tech platforms uh, that uses augmented reality and virtual reality. I think uh, nowadays uh, you know, there is no free platform right now, but uh, I think you need to pay a certain license fee, but these technology platforms are available. So, uh, uh, so the uh, second one is so this is the second uh, second one. So second one is uh, we can use these technology platforms to enable this uh, blended learning, teaching learning platform. And uh, this, I think, uh, sh should be kept up. We, sh we should uh, do it phenomenal. Uh, I think uh, we, we should go for at least blended learning, if not totally online. Now, number three is uh, the tech education itself. So uh, now uh, our Ministry of Education is now trying to introduce coding right from the uh, you know, primary school level, right from uh, PP and class one. I, I feel it's good. So uh, uh, now uh, coding is seen as uh, you know, very important for uh, even those students who are not uh, studying uh, engineering. So uh, coding is very important. Uh, last year I, I was in, uh, Taiwan for a very important conference, and there, there was a, a very respected professor, a Taiwanese professor. He teaches in the U.S. and also is a, 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 someone with many patents to his name, Imela. And uh, he was saying that uh, in, in, in one of the universities where he teaches, even the low students are required to learn some coding. So the co coding has become so important in Imela. So that way, uh, I, I feel that uh, tech education itself I, I think it's very important. So uh, besides uh, all uh, tech, uh, using tech for other subjects, but the tech education itself, uh, I, I think is uh, very important. And on that note, uh, let me share my own personal experience. Uh, you know, After class 12, I got a scholarship and I went to study uh, in Australia. Uh, so I went down there to study engineering and the course that I was sent for was electrical engineering. And uh, that was like 1996, from 1996 to 1999. I, I was there for four years. I graduated in 1999. As an electrical engineering student, I learned a lot of coding. So when I came back and started my job at Bhutan Telecom, they very badly needed someone who knew programming. So that's how I ended up doing a computer science job rather than electrical engineering job. So since then, uh, my direction went towards IT. But today, even today, I think our electrical engineering students in Bhutan don't learn as much coding as I learned more than 20 years ago. So how far behind are we? This question needs to be very much asked. In the late 1990s, all the Australian 
Australian uh, universities were teaching coding to even electrical engineering or civil engineering students back then. But in Bhutan, even now, our other engineering students are not learning much coding. So I, I think there's a lot that needs to be re reflected on. So how, how far behind are we, Ani? Number four, the uh, fourth one is about using technology to uh, continue our education process uh, during this pandemic. I, I think this is very important. I am sure that the education ministry must be very concerned right now. Now that uh, the community transmission is confirmed, I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, you know opening the schools right away will be a uh, problematic thing. So now the education ministry might have to resort to some means to continue the you know teaching learning for our children. So in, in that respect, I, I feel that uh, the, uh, the tech can uh, really uh, help. And uh, uh, even before they reopened the schools, uh, they, they had started giving assignments through Google Classroom. Uh, but uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, the teaching itself, it was broadcast on BBS TV. I'm not sure whether you uh, whether uh, they were these lessons were uploaded on YouTube. If not, I think uh, you sh we should have a uh, we should have some YouTube channels open for different subjects or uh, maybe school wise or overall. I, I feel that there's uh, some something like that uh, could really help. Maybe besides YouTube, there may be other uh, other technology uh, platforms that can enable that. I think that will really help. For instance, uh, you know, uh, if you have to turn on the TV, then you 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 have to catch it at the right time. But if it is on a platform like YouTube, you can go and watch it anytime you like. So uh, uh, that is one. And uh, Google Classroom, I, I think, is in terms of uh, uh, giving the assignments and handing in the assignments is quite good. Uh, probably exploring more more on that and. Um, the main thing is on how, how you deliver the lessons. I think uh, that uh, can be done on technology. Say no message. So those are the four things. Now I come to the last part of my uh, talk and that is the recommendations. So I, I would like to just give three recommendations. So one is directly related to the last part that I talk about. Please uh, implement uh, you know, uh, teaching learning. Uh, uh, using technology uh, during this COVID situation. So it needs to be improved uh, uh, from better than what it was earlier. Uh, for instance, if I were to give the example of my own sons, uh, they, were, they, they couldn't really catch the lessons, but they were mostly learning on their own. And then they at least uh, were submitting the subjects, uh, uh, sub uh, submitting the assignments. But uh, if there is some some way uh, online that they can watch the lessons anytime they are free, I think that would uh, be much better. And if possible, maybe even having a kind of, a, you know, some sessions being delivered via Zoom like this. Uh, but I think the challenge will be that uh, not all uh, students will have access to uh, internet connection and devices. So that takes me to the second recommendation. So the government needs to come up with a strategy to you know, try and close the digital divide as much as possible. So that, uh, uh, you know, uh, our sons and daughters, they have access to internet, they have access to devices, but what about the, you know, people from the rural areas and, and uh, underprivileged, uh, you know, children, even in the town areas. So that needs to be thought over. Uh, number three, Number three, I think uh, one of the most important is that our education ministry uh, and also the teachers, uh, we, should, we should really focus on making the children explore and learn on their own. I think it's because of not, not making them do that, that they are too just exam focused and you know, syllabus focused. So in this day and age, learning the facts are not important. In fact, even I think uh, we can have uh, open book exams these days so that they don't have to memorize, but uh, you can ask questions based on critical thinking or searching for answers by on their own using the internet and things like that. That, that is, I think, more realistic. So uh, I think focusing on making the children explore more and make them ask questions uh, it should not be just uh, learning facts and not just uh, confined to syllabus. I, I think this is very, very important. 
Otherwise, we will have a lot of engineers who have never heard of Elon Musk, even in this day and age. So that, 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 that is my last point. And related to that, I would also like to mention again, because a lot of uh, people are here from the education uh, fraternity. I, I, I think that there need not be too much focus on, you know, uh, uh, making the children cut their hair too short and things like that. You know, uh, let, let the hair be clean and all that. Let them be, uh, you know, uh, make, make, them, make them really inquisitive and explore and things like that. Just focusing too much on, you know, cutting the hair and all that. Even during our high school days, it was not so. I, uh, I was not one, one, of, uh, one of them, but we had many uh, friends who had great hairstyles, but they were neat and clean. So I, I think uh, this is one, it seems that this is one that uh, most of our young people had about school. You know, their, their, their hair is cut very short. So rather make them innovative, make them ask questions, make them, you know, explore. I think this should be the focus. Uh, that's all, uh, thank you. Plus, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tsering. Focus on the mental instead of the physical attributes. <laughs> At the end. Thank you so much, La. I'm going to invite uh, Sangil Hazu to speak next, La. Les, um, hello, can everyone hear me, La? Yes, yes, clearly. Okay, great. I have a brief presentation that I'm going to use. It's not incredibly informative or incredibly earth shattering, but it's just something to sort of guide my points as I move forward. La. Um, so just as to provide a little bit of context, la, um, I'm, my name is Sangi and I'm currently working with the InnoTech department at DHI. La. Um, and although I'm working at DHI, I actually do have a passion and some sorts of background in education. La. I have a master's degree in international education policy and I formerly worked with the Royal Academy in Bambisala. Um, so essentially I, have experience working on a policy level la, when it comes to like education and digitization and technology. Um, but um, I think because of that, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is more on a big picture level. La. So I would like to apologize if I'm missing out on any details um, <laughs> for people who are more detail oriented. Um, but to get started, la, when, I, when I think about technology and education, I think it's so important for us to go beyond using YouTube videos and Zoom and Google classes. I think this was brought up by Sir Sonam in the group chat as well. I think very often we consider a PowerPoint as using technology in the classroom, or we consider just using Zoom and um, online communication as a form of technology. But I think there's so much potential for us to go beyond all of that. Um, and I think that when we talk about using technology in the classroom, I think it's, it applies at all levels of learning. So this goes to early childhood education, it goes to elementary school, primary school. And I actually think that this is something that needs to be taken into consideration when we talk about um, education beyond tertiary learning. So when we talk about reskilling channels for adults as well. Um, and similarly, I think a lot of the times when we talk about incorporating technology into education or sort of adapting our education systems to keep up with technology. Like I think Ampek mentioned who's keeping up with who more, like technology or are people, people guiding technology or are people, are, are, is technology guiding people? Uh, but I think the way technology is moving and how fast things are changing really calls for fundamental restructuring, uh, not just incorporating things back and forth, a few things here and a few things there, but we really need to fundamentally understand and think about redesigning the structure that exists around learning. Uh. So I'm in no mean, no ways an expert, uh, but I just want to share a few things that I think need to be considered or thought about in the way that technology changes education. Uh. So I think it's become quite apparent from a lot of what my um, fellow panelists have said uh, that because of technology and because of the wealth of information that's made accessible through technology platforms, uh, the what of learning has changed. La. I think content-based learning is something that has become somewhat obsolete. La. There's no point making children memorize a multiplication table if they can just do it on a calculator. La. So honestly, like I think we're leaning towards a more skill-based curricula, which I think is really important. And it's something that we really need to start prioritizing in the classroom. La. We need um, curricula that supports skill-based learning and also that encourages people to try. La. I think that's something that's become really apparent with technological advancements is we need to start encouraging people to sort of take risks. So the what 
that they're learning needs to be about challenging themselves, developing new skills, learning and relearning. La. This is something that I think has come up in the uh, previous presentations as well. La. But with the way things are changing in this day and age, la, I think it's really important for people to know how to unlearn something and relearn it as fast as they learn something from scratch. La. So this whole focus and the skills that are needed for learners to be adept to the new world is actually um, really important to consider la, when we talk about education. And similarly, la, I think something that technology has also changed is how people learn. La. So of course, this is very apparent. People are now learning through multi, like uh, social media, multimedia resources. They're engaging all of their senses and so on. But I think what I'm trying to get at here is that the power of data, la, the platforms that we have accessible to us and technology that we have accessible to us has really given us the opportunity to empower learners to sort of take control of their own learning. La. So till now, when we think about assessments, especially when I think about assessments when I was in school, it's a matter of, did you pass? Are you going to go to class nine after class eight or are you going to stay in class eight, right? Like, it's like a very like pass fail binary metrics. But with the power of data and the power of predictive models, la, I think we have the capacity to inform students about how they're learning, about their learning trajectories. We're, we can provide learning analytics that help students understand these are my strengths, these are my weaknesses, and this is how I can better myself. La. This really provides the opportunity for some sort of individualized learning curricula, la, which honestly, I'm sure many people have been trying to do it in the past, but because of lack of human resources or just not having enough teachers or not having enough human capital have been able to do, but now with data, and now with the power of digital technology, this is something that we can really infuse in our education system. La. And I think this will really help change the way people learn. And I think that will be for the best as well. La. And something, uh, the third point of what I think technology is doing to change education is technology is sort of changing where we learn and who is responsible for learning. La. So like I've been saying, technology has made so much information accessible via the internet and all these other platforms. La. So where students learn, it's really changing. La. So like you don't really need a school. You don't need a physical structure for schools anymore. And of course, maybe this is more important at a primary level or an elementary level of schooling. But speaking more towards a tertiary um, perspective, la, you don't need a physical structure where students learn. La. You just need the intellectual space, the platform for students to learn. And of course, we need to make sure that it's accessible. But I think the whole image of schools with these like large campuses and this, in, this huge investment in physical infrastructure is becoming quite obsolete. La. It's a little bit controversial, but I, I personally believe that in the next 10 years or so, like uh, traditional schools or universities are going to become obsolete. La. Because with things like online classes and MOOCs and all of these um, technology, the, all of these resources that are available, um, even having a university degree is something that's becoming not as necessary as it was seen to be before. La. I think people are, uh, the world is moving towards more skill-based um, learning and an understanding of credentials and um, qualifications. And this happens through short courses, through micro-credentialing programs and so on. La. So as the structure of what is considered and what is valued as learning and education is changing, the responsibility of who provides these learning opportunities is also changing love because right now when we have a conversation about education and learning we talk about the school love. this was mentioned earlier as well we talk about the school we talk about the teachers and sometimes we talk about parents love. but i think there's also now um, a shift in the world where we talk about companies organizations governments these employment uh, agencies love. this of course again applies to a more tertiary level but how do these industries um, contribute to learning opportunities? How can they create environments where people are becoming lifelong learners and sort of afforded the opportunities to skill and reskill themselves? So it really does open up the platform for like who is responsible for providing these learning opportunities. For. And I think um, all of these opportunities are quite exciting. Um, I think for me, I see a lot of opportunities and a lot of ways that technology is changing education and the fact that it could really um, sort of transform the way people learn and the way people access things. But I think it's so important to recognize that if tech savvy curricula is only made available in 
urban areas or in wealthy schools or in private schools, you're, we will, by virtue of the education opportunities and the education system, be widening social inequalities though, because this immediately has an effect on the types of jobs and the types of livelihoods that um, young people are going to be able to afford themselves or even people or even working adults though, if they're not afforded the opportunity to reskill themselves and become more technologically savvy in the area that they're working in then they're stuck though, and they're left behind so i think when we talk about technology and education it's not just about seizing these opportunities but it's also actually um, a must la, for in inclusive growth for all of us. So I think um, this sort of leads me to how, like, what does this call for, right? All of the things that I've mentioned right now, in order to seize these opportunities, what do we need to do? La? And I think that it comes down to a few of the points that I have here on the slide. I think reprioritizing budget is something that's really important. Like coming from a policy perspective, I understand how almost everything we do comes down to budget and resources and how we're going to allocate these budgets. And I think we, at, at the policy level, it's really important for, sit, for people to sit down and assess and think what is valuable for learning and what is valuable for learning in this day and age with the technology that's available to us. Do we need to be investing in physical infrastructure or do we need to be investing in digital infrastructure? Obviously I'm biased here, so I'm not going to really spell out my answer. Um, we also need to transform the teaching profession la, because if we want our learners to be able to learn the best skills and adapt and change and do the best that they can with by leveraging technology, they need to be guided by the best. La. They need to be guided and supported by people who have resources and who have the potential and honestly the capacity to provide support. La. I think a lot of our teachers don't have that capacity or the resources or the training necessary to be able to take things forward. La. So we really need to look at transforming the teaching profession and this isn't just in terms of monetary support in terms of in terms of like reputation it's in terms of actually having them equipped um skill wise to be able to do what's necessary la. Um, i'm a big advocate for non-traditional forms of education la. so and as i said earlier i do think that with technology and with everything that's changing in the world and digitization non-school forms of learning and education are going to become incredibly important in the next few years. So I think this is where we need to start thinking critically about what we have at our disposal and how we can take it further. So the first thing I said is educational media. I'm so excited that we have a book though. My nieces and nephews are his biggest fan. But how can we take it a step further? How can we enhance educational media in Bhutan? I think companies, organizations, corporations, um, the CEOs of all of these places and all of the businesses that we have need to think critically about what their role in creating an, a learning space is la, and how they can contribute towards providing learning opportunities. So you hear about um, acceleration programs, incubator programs, skilling programs, and these are all now considered micro-credentials or um, skills and they're, you no longer need to be verified by a four-year university or so on. So like as that landscape changes, I think it's important for external stakeholders to also consider how they can improve um, and contribute to learning opportunities. And that sort of touches on my next point about moving away from the expectation that schooling has to be a four-year linear trajectory. We need to encourage people to develop skills in various areas, do short courses, be creative and sort of explore different avenues. La. And I would like to believe that if we do all of this, we will be able to empower our learners. La, because the most important thing at the end of the day is that people need to be empowered and be motivated to be lifelong learners. La. And they need to understand that learning is their responsibility and is, is a privilege for them. And that society or all of the relevant people are going to do whatever they can to support that calling for them. La. So it's sort of... Um, we need to provide the resources and the platform necessary to empower our learners as well. And I think last and not, but not least, I think this was mentioned earlier as well with a lot of the learning, relearning and like about the iterative learning process. La. But I think in order to successfully transform education to incorporate technology or to successfully leverage technology for education, la, we need leadership and ownership. La. And I think this is where we need to be willing to try, fail, learn, and then try again. La. That's how technology works. It's an iterative process. There are prototypes for everything. And I think this sort of approach needs to be adapted to um, learning as well. La. I think very often we wait and we try to work on things until we have 
something that we think is perfect, right? But nothing is really perfect. And because things are changing so fast in this day and age, we need to be willing to take risks, put things out there, and sort of be willing to fail and learn from it. Um, it was brief, but I think that is the end of my presentation. Um, Thank you so much, Sange. We're going to have, um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to request Onyir Sangpo to speak next. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I don't have a presentation uh, as such. I'd like to dwell on a few thoughts that I have had on the, the subject of uh, technology and education. And first, uh, I think today's uh, discussion is about uh, leveraging uh, technology to enhance uh, uh, teaching learning and uh, learning experiences of uh, our children and youth. I think in this context, uh, one issue for all of us to think about and discuss, which is uh, digital uh, citizenship. This is uh, already there in uh, our curriculum, but uh, not uh, enough focus has uh, been given to it. Digital uh, citizenship, I think, is digital technology, is, uh, especially ICT uh, with uh, technical and uh, ethical abilities so that we become a productive uh, democratic uh, citizen of uh, a country. So I think, uh, and uh, look at ways uh, in which we can uh, incorporate this uh, more fully in uh, the Bhutanese curriculum. And uh, part of this uh, will come uh, social media. Since I come from the media sector, I would like to dwell on uh, social media briefly. Um, talking about social media, we have, uh, as of now, some 56% uh, percent of uh, Bhutanese uh, people on Facebook and a um, lot of other people on uh, other social media platforms like Twitter, Instagram, uh, and uh, many Bhutanese on blogs and so a uh, section of our population on social media. And um, youth, uh, I don't have uh, data on the, the percentage of youth uh, on social media, but uh, uh, we can safely presume that uh, between 80 and 90% of Bhutanese youth could be on social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, not many on Twitter, mostly on Facebook and Instagram and some others. Therefore, this is a huge population. Now, the, the premise of uh, my suggestion is that uh, if, uh, if uh, such a huge percentage of uh, Bhutanese people, uh, particularly youth on social media, I think uh, the Bhutanese education system needs to go after them, not... Uh, not uh, initiate bans and uh, uh, initiate uh, uh, traditional uh, methods of controlling uh, our children and youth. That's uh, what uh, our system tends to do. Uh, not, uh, not the education system itself, but uh, in 2008, we had uh, the Bhutanese uh, uh, government uh, departments and ministries uh, banning Facebook and offices. Uh, even as Singapore was trying to uh, use uh, Facebook to deliver public services. So I think uh, if a huge percentage of our people, children and youth on social media, I think uh, it's time for the education system to encourage our children and youth, our teachers, uh, to use social media to teach and learn, to collaborate, uh, to uh, to work together, interact, etc. So how do we use uh, social media to enhance uh, teaching, learning, to enhance collaboration? I think uh, there are a number of ways uh, in which uh, we do that. Uh, and uh, there are a number of guidelines uh, uh, developed by many schools and universities in the West uh, to uh, 
to guide uh, children and teachers uh, uh, use social media for learning, for research, for teaching, etc. So if you use social media for teaching learning, what are the advantages? And I think uh, we need to underline some of uh, uh, them here. First one is uh, um, if you use social media like Facebook, um, our children and our teachers can uh, help uh, develop content. And uh, that includes uh, um, improving, honing their uh, writing skills, editing skills, photography skills, uh, photo editing, video editing, and a lot of other skills that uh, we can develop. Uh, these are some of the skills uh, lacking in our education system. And uh, these are skills uh, that are very, very difficult to teach in the traditional uh, classroom setting. The children, the youth can learn on their own if, uh, if they're given access to social media. And of course, uh, as uh, some of uh, our friends uh, uh, previously express uh, their concern, there are a uh, lot of uh, ethical, moral, and uh, social concerns uh, regarding children's and youth's uh, use of 2008 or 2009, I think, uh, just because the water is murky that we cannot dismiss uh, the need for water. Uh, we need to use the SIFT, uh, I think. And the uh, second advantage of using social media in education is, is uh, collaboration, and which uh, could include uh, crowdsourcing of, of ideas, data mining, joint projects, uh, um, and uh, interaction. And social media uh, is also known to uh, improve uh, students' uh, interpersonal skills. And of course, uh, it goes without saying that social media uh, uh, facilitates uh, interactive uh, learning. Therefore, I think it's um, in the use of social media. So in short, uh, it is about uh, uh, leveraging technology or uh, particularly ICT uh, as a uh, cross-curricular uh, feature, uh, meaning across, uh, meaning using uh, technology, um, the help of technology across uh, different curricula, not just, uh, not just uh, in the technology or science uh, uh, curriculum, And uh, having said that, uh, leverage uh, technology, ICT, uh, social media uh, to uh, enhance uh, teaching. Uh, there are the risks and there are dangers out there on social media. Uh, the, our uh, taking advantage of social media needs to be accompanied by, as Ampeg mentioned, uh, media literacy. So I think uh, media literacy needs to start early. I think uh, it's uh, not about uh, uh, not uh, handing out uh, tablets or mobile phones or uh, the digital technologies and, uh, to our students. Uh, it is about uh, how do we encourage them to use uh, them uh, positively. So that's it, Nange. Nice, thank you, Onyadop. Um, now on, you are up next. I'll request you to speak now. Uh, hello, Kusambola. Uh, I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Uh, my name is Ngaong Gyalsen. And uh, just to briefly introduce myself before we delve, before I delve into the topic at hand. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur and an artist. Uh, much of my work uh, revolves around my belief that to solve the problems of the future, we need an interdisciplinary approach to things. Uh, and we need to be uh, lifelong learners. 
uh, how I do that in my personal career, or in my professional career, is that, uh, for example, I'm currently the Ministry of Agriculture to develop a value change, a value change system for an agricultural, organic agricultural product. Uh, I also serve as a producer for Bhutan Echoes Festival, which is an incredible literature festival under the patronage of Her Majesty, the Queen Mother, and therefore is a community of storytellers, thought leaders, um, change makers in Bhutan and around the world. Uh, I've also, I also work with a group of entrepreneurs and on entrepreneur econ in creating a cryptocurrency for the African subcontinent and uh, the emerging economies of the world. So as you can see, uh, much of my work is in various industries and, uh, uh, and this gives me a unique perspective on things. Uh, so uh, it's also a very fulfilling uh, set of uh, uh, work in different industries. Uh, before I and that's my introduction. And before I uh, talk about uh, what I have thought about when uh, comments on VTOP's page about, you know, like when when the this forum was announced, people mentioned that there's a need for outsiders to come and comment on education. Uh, but I think that education is such a school of thought that no one is truly an outsider, even though I am not working in the education system, in the education ministry of education, or even though I'm not a teacher, I don't think that I am an outsider because we, all the panelists here and the viewers are uh, in one way or another products of the education system. And therefore you can ask not only uh, some of the here uh, comments from some of the panelists here, not only as uh, expert opinions, but also as uh, real life experiences that can really help develop the system. And with that, I would like to begin by thinking out loud, well, what is the purpose of education? Uh, personally, to me, I think that uh, education is about create uh, value in society. And if we agree that's the purpose, then I think that uh, multiple solutions can be brought forward to, to enable such a system to work. Uh, and before we discuss about what change needs to be brought in the education system in general, I think that uh, at the at the core of the at the heart of the discussion, I think we need to make a key distinction between education and schooling. I uh, I personally think feel that in many cases uh, the word education and the word schooling is used inter interchangeably, uh, uh, difference, and that needs to be acknowledged. Education does not necessarily have to take place in a school setting, uh, which were as mentioned by some of the panelists who came before me. And I think that's a key distinction. And therefore, budget prioritization, as Sange mentioned, can happen when a key distinction like that is made. For example, look at the only public library in Kimpula and what state it is in. Uh, despite having so much funding for education at per se Mula. And I'll talk a little bit more on uh, our obsession with infrastructural development as a proxy for real innovation. The key distinction between education and schooling. I think there, there are many challenges for uh, uh, that uh, education systems around the world face. But particularly the most concerning challenge I feel is the disconnect between um, education systems uh, in, uh, that predominantly consists of schools, uh, the disconnect between the education system and the society in general. And I think that the questions that we need to ask, such as, uh, are we preparing our youth, are we preparing ourselves for uh, the jobs of the future? You know, uh, people were talking about the digital divide. How can we, uh, uh, how can we uh, bridge the digital divide? Uh, and you know, is it possible? And how fast can we do that? then uh, the, uh, some things that we can uh, then think about is, you know, um, what would a post-industrial uh, education system look like? Now? So by an industrial education system, I mean the traditional way of, uh, uh, today's in the traditional school setting, it's teacher-centered, uh, where, you know, uh, rote learning, uh, uh, you know, memorization being a 
fundamental part of it is no is uh, thought to be the only way one can learn and having a very archaic uh, assessment system which is in many cases exams like, where you know the only uh, what information is retained by an individual or how well he, he or she performs in this high stress environment is measured and uh, creativity uh, interpersonal skill um, uh, uh, the ability to uh, innovate uh, in face of real life problems, these things are not considered. So that's a traditional uh, education reform. We need to think about what the education, uh, post-industrial education will look like. So these are some of the questions. And again, also, uh, what does education measure? Uh, these are some of the questions that um, give, uh, are all, I think come from the fundamental problem, which is the disconnect. Now, uh, to provide some of the solutions that when it comes to uh, the jobs of the future, I think that uh, the jobs of the future are by definition uh, something that uh, we cannot fully be, uh, that we cannot be certain about, about jobs of the future is that, you know, uh, uh, they will require a completely different set of skills. So now as uh, the policymakers, as educators, as uh, uh, as individuals in a society that will be affected by what education reform we take, we can try to develop a charter mission, a charter objective, charter policy, or we can create what Nassim Taleb calls a uh, 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 anti that we face. Now, what I mean by that is, now, uh, Ampek uh, earlier was mentioning something very interesting. It's about relevancy. How do we sell, uh, stay relevant in a changing educational environment, uh, changing um, uh, environment where, you know, like AI, AR, VRs are, you know, and abbreviations of that sort are are the uh, are the key, any skills that are required. So um, to give a solution on that, on, on how we can stay relevant like, is, for example, a, a person who graduates with a particular degree, say a degree in political science or literature, finds that his interest or their interest is in a different, uh, uh, in a very different um, uh, sector. Uh, he has a job, for example, as a social media, uh, in social media marketing. Now, the education ministry needs to, ministry and the education system as a whole needs to provide opportunities uh, for uh, such individuals to learn skills even after they have completed their formal education system. I think that's quite uh, important and it's called basically uh, online based comp uh, comp competency of uh, co courses uh, where they take these short term courses that they can uh, uh, get skills uh, for a relevant task. And I think that is one way uh, we can provide uh, uh, interim measures as to uh, stay relevant with our skills. Uh. Now, another thing that I think is important is uh, mentorship programs. Uh, with the changing nature of schooling, where it no longer will remain uh, teacher-centered, I think there are great individuals, professionals outside of the teach. Therefore, uh, for example, an engineer can be a great facilitator in teaching mathematics to a group of children. So I think education ministry needs to explore such opportunities as well. Fresh graduates who have just completed their degree uh, I think we can also introduce um, not compulsory, but uh, perhaps highly recommended uh, community-based uh, community, uh, programs where these young graduates can become teachers for a short period of time and then learn key valuable lessons as to how to teach and also share their experiences with, uh, uh, with the students. I think such a program can greatly benefit the education, uh, education system. And therefore, I think uh, it's important that the education reform includes such um, uh, such measures where young graduates have the opportunity to become teachers for a short period of time. And now, when we were talking about uh, 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 when, uh, what does education measure, we were uh, uh, talking about, you know, uh, um, uh, when we're talking about what does education measure, I'll give an example on coding. Right now, coding is being highly celebrated and uh, it's looked at as a tool that uh, uh, that young people need to be equipped with. I think that's a step in the right direction, but I think 
if it just remains one step in the right direction, then we do great disservice to the immense potential technology has. And I think in by saying that I am being a devil's advocate because um, I think that uh, coming back to that problem of there being a disconnect between education and uh, uh, society, what good is an uh, engineering college, for example, if there is a simple water problem in a community where the college is located that can be fixed with some structural changes, for example, and innovation. So uh, currently our in our education system, the predominant tool that is used to uh, provide education, which is schools, are functioning uh, in a disconnect between, uh, 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 in a disconnect with the society. I think that needs to be, uh, a, bri uh, a bridge must be connected between that. So for example, uh, people were talking about experiential uh, experiential learning being a key factor of a post-industrial education system. I think a simple way to do that would be we have 250 geoks, uh, 200 plus geoks, and uh, schools in all these geoks. What we can do is that uh, as part of the curriculum, uh, we can uh, introduce um, uh, op uh, opportunities or cha uh, challenges where students need to tackle a communal problem using technology. Now, one fear I have of introducing coding is that uh, if we just introduce it and measure it by how many students we trained, you know, uh, and you know how many hours young people spend or students spend, learners spend in uh, learning coding, then I think we are. Uh, doing a great disservice because alone coding is just a obsolete tool, uh, defunct in meaning. Uh, it needs to solve a societal problem to be useful and therefore uh, institutions, the education uh, system and stakeholders that are introducing coding need to go a step beyond and also try to uh, really enable these young coders to solve real-time societal problems. Only then I think uh, uh, it will have any meaning. So. Um, you know, uh, and uh, I think transformation in curr curricular transformation, uh, transformation, pedagogical transformation, or transformation assessment system is uh, not uh, economic or technical. We have the technical tools. Now, if we reprioritize our budget from our obsession with infrastructural development, like building schools is does not equal uh, real innovation in schooling. Now. So, um, so if we can reprioritize our budget, I think we really have the ability to bring uh, real innovation in education. I think uh, the only barrier that exists are psychological at an individual level, uh, uh, political and uh, cultural at the societal level. Like we need political will to uh, improve education system and the education uh, ministry, uh, to be uh, specific in Bhutan, the education minist uh, uh, ministry needs to be um, take a lead role in that. Like, and uh, bring real changes um, uh, in the uh, education uh, system. So, uh, oh, uh, before I forget, I think uh, we, there's also a case for integrating entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, programs in our schooling. Because if you go back to the start of our uh, of um, my 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 uh, presentation or talk. I mentioned that I think the purpose of education is to enable empower individuals to create value in society. I and who creates more values than entrepreneurs, uh, and therefore I think uh, we need to incorporate entrepreneurship programs in uh, the edu uh, education system, like in schooling specifically, and only then I think we'll see lasting changes. And the whole idea of mismatch between degrees provided and um, uh, and the job market at the end of it uh, only stems because there there is no real communication happening between the education system and the employers uh, and the em current employers. I think if you can bridge this gap, then we will see lasting changes uh, in the education system. I think I went on on a uh, on various directions. I think I did that primarily because education is such a broad subject that if we don't look at it from various angles, from uh, from policy, from uh, the angle of entrepreneurs, uh, then I, I, I think we cannot fully understand uh, uh, the, the immense potential uh, uh, that uh, technology can bring, bring in improving education system.
uh, must have missed out some points. I hope to cover them as I remember them uh, in the later discussion. Thus, thank you. Thanks so much, Ngong. I was pleasantly surprised to hear you bring up Nasib Talib. I'm a big fan of his anti-fragile school of thought as well. But I think that is something that you could develop a little further so that maybe um, other people could also buy into the idea. Um, we have our final speaker uh, for the panel. I'd like to request Mr. Sangi Doji now to present Islam. <coughs> Probably I'm the last speaker today. <laughs> so to briefly introduce myself, my name is Sangi Doji and I am a drone entrepreneur. And then I used to work in a drone company and IoT based company in Malaysia. Currently I'm back in Bhutan and as a digital marketing specialist in Blue Dragon Digital Marketing is now 21st century is the age of convergence. It will keep evolving with exciting new ways as we live, learn and teach in third decade of this century. So I will directly move on to my presentations with the recommendations, and then the I will talk about the need of courses and the 21st century skills to sum up. So I will share my presentation. To begin with, I would directly start with the recommendation, uh, technology in teaching and learning. So firstly, the gamified learning. Learning with fun is often achieved by gamified learning. People can make uh, scavenger questions, question hunting, and people can learn through that. Uh, I'm thankful to the typing master that I enhance my typing skills through that. So. It is an example. And then I would also like to encourage the digital field trip where, where Google Street Views app can be used to use in a cost effective way for teachers to give wider outlook for, for the students. Um, I have some demonstration out here prepared. So, so this is Babi Salam. I don't know, it's stuck now. I'll move forward. It's, it's, So integration of social media is next. Students already spend so much of their time on social media. Integrating its use into your classroom is among the most innovative ways to use technology in the classroom. Shared resources online can be also beneficial by using the Google Classroom, Google Docs, etc. And multimedia incorporation using animations and presentations and all can be also effective. And learning management system above were kind of basic things and the learning man management system and the ARB, ARVR is a new tech that can be and integrated in the education systems of Bhutan. And learning man management system is the concept emerged directly from e-learning, the use of soft softwares, applications for the administration, document, documentation, tracking, reporting, etc., And then uh, we can also, through that, we can also do online assessments. And then we can have open book, open open book examination where, where the education system measures the intellectual intellect of each individual. 
and D A R V R. This is my favorite, and I I learned uh, lots of knowledges and I experienced this uh, A R V R. So so I have a short clip how it looks like. So I would like to play that. Chandrayaan 2 is India's second lunar exploration mission. The mission is planned to use GSMV MK3 to launch an orbiter, lander, and a rover to the orbit and the southern pole of the moon, respectively, taking a pure efficient path utilizing the moon's gravitational field. So, let us explore more about the journey and the objectives of Chandrayaan 2. To space time. AR and VR technology empowers learners to explore and learn at their own pace, thus stimulating learning and comprehension enhances critical retention. So this was the AR VR sample. And then why students benefit from using technology? Integrating technology into classrooms allows for more communication between students and teachers as well as students and peers parents and teachers all of which are vital students academic success so moving forward so i feel the need of more courses in bhutan such as coding uh, coding means using the programming language to get the computer to behave as desired the coding in our existing colleges I feel it's not the industrial base, it's on the academic base. And then we must have the uh, industrial base uh, syllabus in codings and all. And then internet of things, this is a uh, new, new technology. The internet of things describes the network of physical objects using the sensors, connecting sensors for innovative ideas big big data machine learning robotics and artificial intelligence those those are all all the technological courses that are available abroad and then i feel that bhutanese education system must incorporate these courses in bhutan and and digital marketing is also a good cause for website ranking which includes search engine optimization, search engine marketing, social media, paper click, etc. And then the drone technology is also the new new technology, and which there are two layers of drone in Bhutan. And then I feel that the education system must incorporate this these courses and moving forward then looking to the pedagogy tpac is one of the one of the proven result driven pe pedagogy it stands for technological pedagogical and content knowledge and it has its own framework and then there are lots of another result driven pedagogies such as summer and all so it is vital for our education system system to adapt to this kind of result driven pedagogies now i would like to share a systematic a systemic dilemma that's uh, 21st century kids are being taught by the 20th century adults using the 19th century and techniques on 18th century cal calendar this is kind of uh, sarcastic but with due respect to the teachers I must say that the face-to-face -face learning or the traditional learning can't be uh, replaced by the technological learning, and they cannot uh, take take away their outright. So that's where the blended learning comes. The blended learning is 
the blend of the traditional methods and the uh, modern methods of pedagogy in education. So blended learning is also important. So further, I would like to move on to the 21st century skills. It's vital that the collective efforts from the parents, teachers, and students, and the society for the development of education systems in Bhutan. So, first century skills and digital literacy in society is also must. So, I would like to uh, quickly move in the 21st century. <clears throat> Twenty-first century skills in the knowledge era of Industrial Revolution 4.0. I feel it's vital to uplift our education curriculum based on twenty-first century skills. Digitizing Bhutan, there is no question that future leaders of Bhutan must acquire the twenty-first century skills to be competent in the modernizing world. Present education confronts major challenges and issues in both qualitative and quantitative ways because of its lack of innovation and research outlook, scientific temper, and quality assurance. The present engin engineering education is structured with different syllabus consisting of theory and practical courses. The, the ongoing or the existing, existing curriculum can be the stereotype can be broken by introducing the advanced technology and the industry related and the real life hands on experience. That's where we need to focus on the Tibet education reforms. So, not only the formal education, prioritizing those hands on experience skills can be also vital so let's understand the understand the 21st century quickly through uh, through three different categories that includes learning skills literary skills and life skills learning skills enables students to the mental process essential to adapt and improve upon a modern work environment let's move into the aspects of learning skills which is critical thinking discovering solution to problem creative thinking thinking collaboration is a uh, teamwork compromisation and willingness to adapt to the best solution now moving on to the literary literary skills Literary skills concentrate on the way how students can discern facts, publishing outlets, and the technology behind them. There is strong focus on determining trustworthy source, sources and factual information to separate from its from the misinformation flooded in social media and the internet. So, looking into the aspects, information literacy is the foundation skills identifying the fact in digital media and digital comprehension of facts and figures media literacy understanding the methodology in which the information is distributed and the today's main topic technology literacy knowing the machine that makes the information age possible computers and mobile devices became significant in this teaching and learning era. Now, the final category, life skills. Take a look at life skills, takes a look at imperceptible elements in students' everyday life. This intangible focus on their personal and the professional career. These aspects are flexibility, is changing and formulating as per need, learn even when experience knowing when to change what to change how to react to change is skill that will pay dividend in one's entire career leadership leading team to accomplish a common common goal and then leadership alone is alone cannot be considered life skills 
life skills expect along with the leadership it comes the initiative the self starting initiative that's why it it comes to only few people so it is the hardest skills and productivity keeping efficiency efficiency in age of distractions on time creative strategies social the last one meeting others for mutual relationship crucial to ongoing success of a profession the concept of networking lifelong learner we venture into the knowledge era there is critical need of 21st century skills and dispositions along the existing stereotype curriculum it is vital to integrate the teaching innovation and research components for enhancing the professional com competence of graduation graduating students so moving on to the next <clears throat> there's a quote by alvin Toffler. 21st century illiterate will not be those who cannot read and write but those who cannot learn and learn and i missed out is uh, relearn so <clears throat> So that uh, inventing a technology and knowing not to operate by the society is is pretty uh, pejorative. Uh, <clears throat> so we must focus on digital literacy in non-formal education and anti-weight education. And then finally, the Graduates of yesterday, if they stop learning today, they will be uneducated tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Sange. Um, we ended on a high note with all your high-tech examples. I hope it's a reality someday in Goodness. Well, classrooms or uh, intellectual spaces where we can do VR. Um, that would be fantastic. Um, uh, we have actually almost reached the original duration of the panel, but Sir Nobu sent a message out um, to everybody saying that we can go uh, a little over time. I beg of your indulgence at this point. Um, I want to actually ask a question. We are having a really vibrant discussion in the chat room if those of you who are attending the panel have been following. Um, there's, it's a parallel at times. Um, and many a times echoing whatever the panelists have discussed. Um, although there were several questions that were required to be asked, I want to couch it in one general question after having heard all of the speakers, all of our wonderful panelists here share your ideas, um, your views. I want to know because I want to, I want to take us now because we've looked at a way forward as if like it is ahead of us, physically ahead of us. Now I want to take us to a space and time uh let's say we are already 10 years ahead and we're looking back i want you to look at the outcomes that you would consider as defining um successful blended learning um i will not make allowance for traditional education because the whole point of this panel was really how do we look at a way forward um, at an education system that incorporates or has mainstreamed technology in it. So I would like to request our speakers um, to think about this for a moment and any one of you can react to this and um, let me know, um, share with us what you think would be a measure of success then. Imagine yourself in a place 10 years from today and looking back and then saying, oh yeah, we've been really successful at this and this would really uh, define what uh, having mainstreamed technology and education successfully would look like. Ha is that clear, La? Dear panelists, <laughs> did I speak too fast? <laughs> Hi, I'm sorry, can you rephrase what you said? I'm sorry, I, I think I had trouble um, getting the gist of what you were... Okay, no, what I meant is, um, so far from all of, all of the presentations and the conversation we've had, is that this is a way ahead of us, but I want us to imagine that we've already arrived at a place somewhere in the future 10 years from now, and we're looking back and we've seen that certain things have been done to mainstream technology into education, and we're seeing the kind of education that we're talking about today. What would you then... 
um, identify as a measure of success in that situation that you're already there and you're looking back. Is that clearer, Sangye? May, may I, Namge? Uh, Kezang here? Yes. Last, last, Kezang, yes. Last, I think we have already embarked on that path. Uh, and so we are not even looking at 10 years from now, but uh, say two, three years down the line, we, our measure of success uh, would be uh, graduates uh, who can be uh, employed uh, anywhere in the world not only in Bhutan. So that, that is the matrix. Uh, uh, one of our uh, key metrics for now is uh, employability uh, within, uh, within uh, nine months of uh, graduating from our uh, institute. Uh, so basically a wholesome um, a graduate who, is, uh, who, who finds a job or who becomes an entrepreneur uh, and runs his own on, on business. So that will be the kind of uh, success uh, metric that uh, we are uh, looking at Namgi. Les, thank you, Sir Kezang. Um, thank you for bringing that up. I did hear uh, many of the panelists um, underscore autonomy in learning, and I think this is quite in line with that as well. Um, if any other panelists would like to uh, speak at this point, Les. Yes. Um, hi, hi, Onamge. Um, so for me, I think it's actually, it would actually be the rate at which we're able to adapt to change that because I think as Nawang uh, rightfully pointed out, uh, the idea of the, a job of the future or the future is that we're unsure. We don't know what changes the future will hold, right? But I think if we're able to successfully incorporate technology or successfully leverage the technology and the tools around us, then the rate at which we're changing or the rate at which we're adapting to upcoming changes will be much faster. Right now, I think the rate at which we're changing is quite slow. But uh, from my perspective, a success would be that that rate of change is diminished. Thank you, Sangye. May I miss Sangye? <laughs> yes, yes, please, Sangye Doji. <laughs> I'll have to say the <laughs> full name. Get two Sangyes. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous today <laughs> since uh, first time conversation. <clears throat> I would say that uh, technology is good servant, but a uh, bad master. So while uh, coming to the rate, while we transform to the modern education with uh, integration of technologies, uh, I feel that it should follow the waterfall model, it, whereby it goes phase by phase. And there must be the contingency security plans dealing with the technologies and then as of when we have the skilled experts and all, and gradually uh, we can transform, transform to modern education or we can successfully integrate the modern technologies in the education. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there are no other panelists uh, who want to jump in, I would like to ask another question. Or is there anybody who'd like to add? Uh, can I add, Namge? Uh, who is that? Is that Uncle Sonomongel? Sonomongel? Yes. Hey, okay, yes, please, yes. Right, so uh, uh, I'm Sonomongel. I'm currently working in Korea as a professor. <clears throat> I've also worked for the Royal Education Council in Bhutan as the director. Um, the question that Namge posed is a good one, I think. And, you know, if I were to answer that, and looking back 10 years, uh, the best thing would be that we would have a comprehensive education policy um, that is sensitive to the benefits of the teachers, um, the rights of the uh, rights of uh, the students, and uh, um, having graduates uh, who are very aware not just about the technical skills, but also about the life in general. I think personal development element, uh, becoming global citizens. I think the education system in Bhutan as per se, wasn't too bad. We are all products of our old system. And if you look around, a lot of us have been faring very well globally. I think what is important is building on that strength and taking us into the 21st century is important. Um, I have uh, 
chatted in the chat room, so I don't want to bring in a lot, but perhaps it's good for us to reflect back on what the Royal Education Council has done in the past. We have worked with experts from Singapore, Canada, US, and India to develop wholesome curriculum for our what we call GNH Beacon Schools. We train over 100 teachers in delivering 21st century pedagogical uh, tech, uh, you know, classroom management, all of that. And we evaluated and found that those schools have performed much better. So perhaps uh, the, the experts here uh, may want to consider looking at what the Royal Education Council has done in the past and then perhaps build a move into the future. Thank you, Namgye. Last, last. Thank you, Uncle. Um, Dr. Sonom Wangyal. Okay, um, returning uh, to our panelists, um, we did think about, now we took ourselves to the future and then we look back, uh, but I want to come back to um, quite a few presentations that were made and um, it was as if uh, we um, had taken for granted that everybody has, and I'm going to take from Sai Kezang's uh, presentation, equitable access to um, digital technology in Bhutan. Um, how do we overcome this challenge? Because I've heard, um, I heard Dr. Sige also say, oh, the government needs to bridge the digital divide. So we've acknowledged that there's a digital divide, but I didn't hear many recommendations or solutions uh, because I think uh, telling the government that they need to bridge the digital divide is not a recommendation that is, um, I mean, it wouldn't, I mean, that's what people are saying, but I know that there are such wonderful thinkers here. Uh, how would we, like, how could we give the government a solution or a way forward um, that is beneficial to all involved if we could think a little bit about the digital divide and um, addressing it? Namge, if there is none uh, to kick off, let me, if yes, it's yes, okay. Yes, All right, you uh, go first. <laughs> uh, okay, over to you because I went earlier first. So, Sige, over to you. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't really uh, have a very good answer, but uh, um, I, I, I think uh, the, this is a big question in our mind while uh, our aspirations are very high. Uh, one of the realities is that uh, our educational institutes are very ill-equipped, uh, you know, uh, just to reflect back, uh, I when I was doing my uh, master's and PhD studies in Japan and I came back and then I was visiting my uh, niece's school, a school in which my niece was studying. Um, you know, uh, I felt really sad to see the state of the school. In fact, uh, the classrooms are very crowded and the toilets are very unclean. And the school buildings are, you know, uh, uh, quite in a bad state. And I think this is true of many of our schools. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, that shows that um, uh, how far we are, uh, how, how far the reality is from the aspirations. Uh, um, you know, uh, we don't have computer labs in most of the schools. And even some of the, you know, higher institutes of learning don't have uh, high-speed internet access. So all this uh, really needs to be improved. I, I saw some comments. I think uh, they are there from the people from the education fraternity in the chat, chat room as well. Uh, that a lot of things need to be taken care of on the ground before we can implement uh, most of the things that we have been talking about. So these are some of the realities. Now. Coming directly to your question on the digital divide itself, I think what the government is thinking right now is probably um, uh, they have plans about uh, taking internet to the schools, uh, taking high-speed internet to the school, schools, but uh, now to empower the children to access that uh, you know internet facility, I, I think the government is uh, right now looking at uh, uh, providing a tablet to each student. Uh, that is what the government has in mind. And um, I, I don't have a, really have a good alternative idea, but uh, I, I was thinking that uh, maybe 
the government should uh, uh, give those uh, tablets to the students that really need them and uh, the students who can afford for example i am i am not a well to do person but uh, you know working in the capital i can i can give tablet to my own own sons own children so i i thought that uh, maybe uh, uh, give this kind of support to the people who really need it that way i think uh, we we save on the government budget as well and i have seen that in fact in japan most of these kind of government subsidies are focused on the people who really need them and they they have this uh, data from the tax filing uh, details and all that in bhutan you can afford to give this kind of facility to their own children need, need not take it from the government so that the government don't have to shell out uh, not a lot of money to uh, provide this kind of uh, devices so th this is a quick reflection I, I don't know other panelists may have better ideas thank you yes, thank you that's okay uh Sake you wanted to jump in uh last number thank you la a uh, few quick points uh, with regard to the digital divide and how perhaps uh, technology could uh, help uh, uh, bridge it uh, in the sense of haves and have nots uh, it's a stark in the sense 70% of our population is still considered rural uh, i remember uh, uh, when uh, we started uh, this uh, competition in the telecom market uh, we had tashi cell coming in and uh, we were able to rope in about 777 million as a universal service fund uh, and uh, that was matched by bhutan telecom so that comes to about 1.5 billion and uh, that's how rural uh, mobile network has been rolled out and uh, when i uh, went to my village which used to be three days walk uh, when i was a student but uh, we have now roads and uh, mobile connectivity it wasn't 3g or 4g but 2g and i could actually from time to time uh, do work from uh, my village uh, so there is uh, 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 drops of uh, <laughs> hope in the sense uh, of uh, connectivity Uh, and i was thinking maybe in terms of infrastructure rather than rather than giving uh, ipads uh, which is going to be very costly uh, unless uh, we come out uh, with with a proper financial uh, model for that uh, i was thinking perhaps labs uh, computer labs uh, might be a solution in schools since uh, we already have physical spaces uh, and also in terms of mobilizing uh, computers uh, we have uh, Uh, government people the geok administration uh, the zonghok administration then we also have the community centers which are used for a fraction of uh, uh, an hour in a day um, uh, perhaps uh, uh, we could use that uh, use uh, you look at uh, optimally optimally utilizing those uh, common uh, resources uh, sharing uh, those la so that's one point and uh, the other point i also thought uh, i was given to understand there is a disaster recovery uh, communication network uh, with uh, help from the indian government and uh, it's connecting uh, every district uh, and as i i was uh, 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 saddened to uh, know that uh, this is of course for disaster recovery but then when it is uh, time for disaster recovery it's not probably functioning because you haven't probably tested it so perhaps this is an infrastructure that we could look at utilizing uh, as well uh, so these are these are some uh, some things i think uh, could help in terms of bridging the divide having been in the ict sector in my government days uh, we have been trying uh, and uh, i think uh, bearing some fruits but uh, on the flip side i think it is to do with the content the culture the system Uh, the system uh, the the quality of teachers are teachers ready i city literate enough to uh, you know teach uh, students la so and uh, i i guess the way maybe to come bottom up in the sense of focusing on the rural folks rural students rather than urban students come up and then perhaps uh, because urban students in any case have access uh, abundant access uh, i guess uh, overly uh, uh, utilized Uh, actually misused to a large extent so perhaps uh, 
looking at from that angle uh, might be might be some of uh, some i'm just uh, sharing my thoughts in the sense of uh, some possibilities uh, that could be looked at la thank you namgi yes so kesang i think you also um echoing what uh, uh, dr chin sige said as in uh, prioritize the needs of rural students first right uh yes that's what because uh, uh, we already i think we have to look at rural semi rural and semi urban and urban in the sense of uh, uh, coming uh, bottom up uh, uh, so that uh, we we ensure which will provide which will result in providing a uh, a uh, uh, closer to equity in education less less thank you so much You're on mute, though. We are still uh, on mute, so we can't hear you. Who is muting me? I think it's the one who's muting me. Hello, I'm unmuted now. Um, Sangeet Hasan, did you want to speak at this point? Yes, la. Um, I just want to mention three point. Uh, just one point, very briefly, la. Um, I feel like when we talk about about bridging the digital divide it kind of comes back to a lot of it is like i mentioned in my presentation finance and budget law so on the topic of finance and budget i feel like what i mentioned earlier about reprioritizing what the budget is used for is something that we really need to think about law i think it really needs to be reconsidered um sometimes i do feel like budget is to, um is given for things that might not be particularly necessary for learning and education so that needs to be reconsidered The second thing is that there are a lot of global initiatives that are working on bridging the digital divide la so the UNICEF has this project called the Giga project la that's working on trying to connect every school through internet so sort of being proactive and very targeted about seeking these sorts of international collaborations i think is important la as opposed to just taking things that come our way i think our leaders in the policy sphere need to be more proactive about seeking collaborations that are relevant back to what i mentioned in my presentation about sharing the responsibility for who is responsible for education la i think as it's become abundantly clear everybody benefits from a sound education system la so it's important that everybody sort of uh, pitches in la so like maybe it's not just the government still divide la i think maybe corporations organizations and other social societies and individuals and society you need to consider what their role is also in that la so sort of creating a platform for that is important okay thanks thanks i'll try to write as fast I'm as sorry <laughs> hopefully i have all of- <laughs> no i'll get i'll get back to that in a bit as well but um thank you so much for sharing your thoughts i want abek and maybe onyurup also to jump in now so we could talk a little bit about media lit- literacy digital literacy um right now um abek uh, you did allude to how in children as young as 6 um to get on platforms like tiktok uh, without realizing the mental um emotional ramifications of such a thing so i wonder if um could take a little bit time to elaborate on what you touched upon in your presentation now thank you um okay yes yeah so you you mean um as in when you said very okay. briefly touched upon um you're saying oh okay we could uh, we have a social media policy but we could also have guidelines for parents etc so maybe for the benefit of everybody who's attending this and i could write down um uh, write this down in more mm. detail you could elaborate mm. on that um okay so what we we have observed anyway over the years is that um you know while technology is great right if we're not prepared to use it we can get really misled right we end up uh, reacting uh to communications without thinking right we post things that we might regret later on you know when we're about to apply for a job for instance so these guidelines that we talked about i think first of all we do need social media policies and once we have those it can be cross cutting from government civil service to schools we should even question should teachers um accept facebook friends from students I think this is an issue that other countries also talk about um while 
it would be good because we have that level of trust here. In some places, it's an age issue. It's many, many other issues. So we've noticed that uh, most of our kids go on Facebook and parents are the ones who sign them up on it. So we, we believe that, you know, implicitly what the parents are doing without realizing is that they're telling their kids, it's okay, you can bend rules. Do you know what I mean? I, I mean, the, the minimum age to be a, 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 to have a Facebook account is 13. TikTok is 13, or, but many know that while it's 13, they believe that it should be at least 15, you know, because you're quite vulnerable when you're out there unprepared. So what we're modeling is the fact that we ourselves as adults are learning to break rules and telling our kids, it's all right, break rules, go in there. We're totally unprepared. So we do need um, not only policy, but for family, maybe family guidelines, we're saying, you know, where family will say, when we have a meal, we come together for Nilo, let's all put away our devices. Let's sit and have a meaningful conversation and not be all busy posting. Um, we are also observing, you know, sometimes um, uh, youngsters uh, using it really well, but there are also those who feel, you know, you talk about the digital divide, those without a smartphone feel lesser, right? We have many of these issues. So I think uh, once we have good social policy, social media policy, not just for teachers, for young people, for families. And then we have guidelines for them so that we're all quite clear and we are not putting out the nastiness out there, right? And with pand the pandemic, you've seen the amount of misinformation, the harassment and things that take place. And we know people even post videos that go viral, uh, you know, and uh, all that is all very unfortunate. And it's only because we lack that literacy that we need to have. So um, basically, it's, uh, I think that's, that's what's required. And, and it's already starting to happen. It's already starting to happen. And that's why I feel that instead of giving uh, tablets to everyone from the time they're young, I think one success story would be your first question, is that 10 years from now, our young PP, class one, class two kids are still running around and playing, catching and hide and seek and really still playing with real people instead of playing online, you know, online games. I think there are a lot of studies, you know, it's all out there. It's easy enough for us to read them. And uh, I, I feel in a, in a culture like ours, it's better to have people to people contact and, and uh, real relationships, especially when we're young. So that, that's, that's it. Yeah. And before I go off, I think one thing, if I may add a, a story of success, you said, I think that as we embrace more technology, you know, we mustn't forget the basics of reading, writing, arithmetic, and the humanities and social sciences, which are critical. We can't just have a technological educational system and approach and drop the humanities and social sciences, because that, that would then mean that we end up being driven by all kinds of other influences, and we might not even be aware of it. So I'd like to just put that out there. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, La Ampek. Also, um, on your example, I think you're still online. This is something I want to ask you and other panelists also welcome um, to jump in and then talk about it. We are going to be submitting this document to the education ministry. And um, those of us who are here, well, the majority of us feel that technological advancement of education is going to be fantastic. Um, there are people like Ngong and Sange who don't believe in physical infrastructure. But if you look at the people that inhabit the education system, in Bhutan right now, I would say that the um, thought process is still a little conservative. So how do we marry our aspirations, um, the, what we've discussed here on this platform, uh, with what could be the expectations um, on the ground? Uh, how do people fear technology less and embrace it more? so that we can have an education system that we've discussed today. Onyu, do you want to jump in now? Thank you, Namge. I don't know if I understood your question correctly, but uh, before answering your question, I think uh, I'd like to add uh, 
a little bit on uh, what Ampex said on uh, uh, social media and media literacy. And as I said uh, in my little presentation earlier on, um, if uh, social media is huge and uh, if uh, using technology in uh, education uh, means embracing uh, social media um, largely by uh, teachers and students, I think uh, we need to prepare uh, teachers and uh, students uh, to use uh, social media productively, responsibly. That's why we need a uh, lot of investment uh, in uh, social media, media literacy in general and social media literacy in particular. Um, it's not that uh, we haven't done anything uh, on this front. There's been a lot of uh, work done. There's a social media policy of the Royal Government of Bhutan and uh, there's a social media module for villagers another module for high school and college students, and uh, uh, one module for working professionals developed by Bhutan Media Foundation, but uh, we haven't been able to use them much. And, and by the way, the Royal Government of Bhutan's social media policy is hardly read by um, anyone. It sits with MOIC right now. So I think uh, we, we need to match uh, the use of technology by uh, media literacy so that uh, our use of uh, technology in education doesn't backfire. So in terms of uh, uh, how open-minded I, I think uh, uh, our people need to be in terms of using meant. Yeah, so um, in a way, like I was saying, those of us who are here, we know that technology is good, that it has very many advantages. Um, and then we have this aspirational way forward. But how would you, what if we're making it, like, you know, we're submitting this document to the education ministry. How do we pitch it to the ministry and the people who are reading it so that it is acceptable and doable and mm -hmm. uh, not very scary? I think... I think many, many Bhutanese and uh, especially in the government departments uh, think that uh, social media is bad for children, bad for adults. Uh, social media uh, creates a lot of disharmony in society. And uh, this is, this is uh, generally what Bhutanese think of uh, uh, ICT in general and social media in particular. And therefore, I think uh, the answer to this is uh, media literacy. So we at uh, different levels and uh, the village community level and high school and college level and even uh, at uh, the working professional level um, for our MPs, uh, for our CEOs, our secretaries, government uh, directors, everybody needs uh, social media, uh, media literacy uh, so that they understand uh, the advantages uh, of uh, uh, using, uh, embracing uh, ICT and uh, media. Lasso, uh, Lasso thank, thank you. you. Before I wrap up, I don't know if maybe Ngawang wants to jump in at this point because you're talking about an interdisciplinary approach, how you think everything is connected to each other. Uh, Ampek also did allude to it a little while earlier, but Ngawang, would you want to jump in? To uh, uh, reform, transform education. What I meant by that was, uh, for example, a newly elected uh, politician has this. Uh, ha uh, how does he show to his electorate that you know he has ushered in real progress? Uh, he has two options. Let's say like, he, uh, he he can create, he can develop a school uh, equipped with the state of state of the art uh, technology, three D printers, you know, uh, laptops, you name it. And he has option B, which is provide teacher training so that the teachers have relevant skills, uh, provide funding for uh, community problem solving. For example, let's say a group of students in uh, 10th grade as part of their physics project try to develop a, a solution for an irrigation problem that uh, their village faces. And uh, whether 
can we arrange necessary funding for that? So when we measure, uh, compare the two options, uh, a polit or polit uh, political leader or even a bureaucrat uh, is more likely to go with option A because it's something that is tangible and uh, uh, can be used to, to show that there has been real progress. Uh, but I think uh, option B in the long run has greater impact. Uh, so that's what I meant by political will. Uh, sometimes we have to make decisions that uh, have lasting impact uh, and uh, may be required. Uh, now, uh, coming to the uh, point I made about the uh, anti-fragile system. That was my uh, uh, point for the idea that we are preparing ourselves, our younger generation, for the jobs of the future. And that is uh, the rate at which technology, the job market is changing, the, the, rate, uh, the rate at which technology is progressing, that no one can predict what skills will be relevant. La and what skills uh, are, will be required in the future, like what new skills will be required in the future. So to keep up with such a, a, a exponential growth, uh, we need to have a system that can correct itself again and again. And uh, uh, what we're seeing in Bhutan right now with His Majesty um, uh, 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 issuing a royal command saying that, uh, stating that we need to have an education reform is, I personally to me a great example of how uh, anti-fragile system can correct itself according to new information it gets. So it's a step in the right direction. The reform must therefore need to include uh, 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 views from uh, all, of, uh, all the stakeholders and, uh, and should have the courage and the wisdom to uh, make necessary changes as hard as they may be. La. Now, when it comes to uh, social media, la, I think uh, social media plays a, a very important role in how people consume information now, la, information being the unit of uh, uh, education. La. Now, um, there will be challenges. La. I think that almost all of us here may be social, uh, may be addicted to our cell phones. La. I certainly am. I'm always checking as to what uh, uh, you know what my favorite uh, uh, author has said or what my friend is doing. So I think uh, this is only something that will uh, that will uh, continue. I don't think that by uh, uh, banning or you know like developing policies, I don't think that it will translate necessarily into real groundwork. I think what needs to happen is that. Uh, we need to um, develop or uh, um, perhaps develop opportunities like these though, where people can have open conversations as to what can be done. But I think a top-down approach where, you know, the Ministry of uh, Information and Communication comes up with a guideline, I don't really think that will have any, honestly speaking, any lasting uh, impact. But I think, for example, I personally feel BCMD, Bhutan Center for, Center for Media and Democracy's uh, social media literacy program has a far greater chance of actually uh, bringing any lasting change than just a policy document. But that's just that's just uh, my opinion. Okay, Let's thank, thank you. you Thank you so much. I mean, I would continue asking questions because that's what I do for a living. <laughs> but in the interest of time, I'm going to start wrapping up now. I think um, we do have a great set of recommendations from this session. And I, I'm really thankful to all of our speakers for being so professional, for having put so much thought into this. I'm sure Sir Sonam would echo uh, what I am sharing at this point as well. It was so, I think the overarching theme that we heard today was really the experience of unlearning, learning and relearning. And then also, of course, um, transformation. This is what I mean, um, technology is about. Um, if you were to look on your right in the chat room, you'd see that there's a really, like I was saying, it's just brimming with um, wonderful thoughts. And I hope that VTOP can use this to put a really good document together. I have a feeling as a moderator myself that I have a lot um, to provide as input when we have a moderator's discussion after. And I just realized that I did not put on my camera and spoke for a very long time. I apologize. Thank you so much for your time. Um, this was really uh, enlightening for me. And um, I'm very, I was very excited to hear your thoughts and uh, excited to carry these thoughts forward. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Susanam, for having me. Thank you to all of the panelists and everybody who attended today. I have a wonderful Nilo evening. Thank you so much.